push that dial, stick around and smile, because now it's time for Truth or Consequences. Brought to you live from Hollywood by the makers of Old Gold Regulars, Old Gold King Size, and the newest filter cigarette you can buy, Old Gold Filter King. For my research into the thrill of the chase, I found it helpful to assign a trustworthiness grade to the various sources of information. When I use the word trustworthy, I'm not talking about the various degrees between true and false. It's more about confidence. It's about how confident I feel in trusting the information I'm looking at. My level of confidence then determines whether I am willing to spend time researching that information. Categorizing the data in this way was part of my method of trying to avoid being drowned in a sea of misinformation. I thought that the formal classification of the data might help in the long run. In the back of my mind, I was already thinking about a solution scoring system and different methods of reducing cognitive bias. I thought that classifying information into how trustworthy it was might help with that. I divided material related to the chase into five tiers, with tier one being the most trustworthy and tier five the least. I'll give a brief overview of those tiers in this video. The 166 words of the poem are the only thing in tier one. Every other word about the chase, whether from Forrest or anyone else, was subordinate to the poem. Forrest said that his treasure could be found with just the poem and a map. Although Forrest said there were hints in the books, those hints might be just as likely to hurt as help. Because of that, the books were not, in my opinion, as trustworthy as the poem itself. Tier 2 is primarily populated by Forrest's three memoirs, The Thrill of the Chase, Too Far to Walk, and Once Upon a While. For the most part, I did not differentiate between the three memoirs as far as their likelihood of holding hints. Before reading any of the books, I had reason to believe that all three books were full of hints. Also in Tier 2 are long-form video interviews, such as the ones at the Moby Dickens and Collected Works bookstores. This included video interviews where I felt it showed the full context and where it was clear that the answers matched the questions. The Hint of the Month interviews from the Today Show were also Tier 2 material. Many of those hints became what I call constants. The Q&A posts with Forrest over at Mysterious Writings and the scrapbooks from DaleNeitzel.com were Tier 3 sources. Scrapbooks that made their way into one of Forrest's memoirs got upgraded to Tier 2. The scrapbooks, however, were somewhat problematic. I learned quickly not to trust the photos or images attached to the scrapbooks since many of them were not provided by Forrest. Unless the scrapbook was about the image itself and it was clearly labeled that the images came from Forrest, I mostly just ignored the images. There was just too much risk associated with trying to find potential hints within those images. I ended up classifying unqualified images in the scrapbooks as a Tier 4 source. They were something whose origin would have to be investigated before I would spend time trying to figure out what they meant. That meant spending time to figure out whether or not I should spend time. I was already late to the party. That's something I did not have time for. I wasn't always successful in ignoring the images in the scrapbooks, however. Some of those images are compelling, 
and they might hold a hint or two. Because I could see how Forrest pulled stories from the scrapbooks into his memoirs, I felt I could trust the words in the scrapbooks much more than the images. Also, Forrest was active on Dale's website. He seemed to be monitoring the content and would even occasionally post comments. I found it doubtful that Forrest would let someone corrupt his words over the long term. I classified long-form audio interviews, such as the Richard Eads interviews, as Tier 3 as well. I did not trust these as much as the long-form video interviews because I couldn't see Forrest's facial expressions. Tier 4 included edited audio and video interviews where it was not clear whether the answer matched the question. The New Mexico Tourism Advertisement is a good example of this. The full video, however, on the making of that advertisement is a Tier 2 source. I also classified written articles in magazines and newspapers as Tier 4. This included anything where Forrest's words could be twisted to make it seem as though he said something he did not. Now, I am not saying that every article in every magazine and newspaper twisted Forrest's words, but I am saying that the means and the motive were there to do so. For many authors, the primary goal with a story is not the story. The author's primary goal is to sell themselves and to sell their article. Since I have personally witnessed such manipulation occur in non-chase situations, I would not risk trusting those sources. Essentially, sources that I classified as Tier 4 were those that I might get around to if I were still looking for Forrest's treasure 10 years later and I'd run out of ideas. To be clear, I am not saying that there are no hints in magazine or newspaper articles. Forrest may very well have given hints that appear in Tier 4 sources. In fact, I would bet that there are some useful hints in there. But for me, it just was not worth it to spend what little time I had researching those sources. My experience told me that, if given an opportunity, many authors have no problem embellishing a quote to make their article more marketable, and some authors have no problem making up quotes for the same purpose. I treaded very carefully around Forrest's own memoirs for fear of misinterpreting something Forrest had said. With a magazine or newspaper article, I would be analyzing the author's words, not Forrest's words. And even if the author's intentions were 100% pure, there was still the potential for misquoting or misinterpretation. In my mind, Forrest's own words were a minefield. Letting some random author guide me through that minefield was not a recipe for success. Lastly, I treated information from other searchers as a Tier 5 source. I didn't actively go searching for those sources, but if I came across a comment while watching a video or reading a scrapbook, for example, this is how I would classify that comment. There are several reasons why I placed this source so low on the trustworthiness scale. First, other searchers were the competition. It was unlikely they would be giving out information that was worthwhile. On the other hand, it was likely that some searchers, not all, but definitely some, might try to mislead others. While I trusted Forrest not to mislead me, I did not have quite the same confidence in other searchers. Second, I was late to the game and I had zero knowledge of other searchers. While I am certain that most searchers are honorable, I am also certain that there are a few that are not so honorable. 
I did not have time to figure out who was who. Third, even if a searcher was not trying to mislead, there was still a high likelihood that the searcher was taking Forrest out of context or misquoting him. And fourth, even if a searcher was not misquoting Forrest, there was still a likelihood that the searcher's interpretation was incorrect. For the most part, this was just a time management decision. I could not trust that a quote from another searcher was accurate, in context, or interpreted correctly. I could spend time researching another searcher's research, or I could do my own research with the known good sources. I chose the latter. The five-tier grading scale was based on my personal trust level for the information. Outside of Forrest's books, I was only interested in hearing Forrest's exact words spoken in full context. The precise quote with the entire context was important to me. For example, in one of Mysterious Writings, Six Questions with Forrest Fenn, Forrest answered a question with the following statement. Many are giving serious thought to the clues in my poem, but only a few are in tight focus with a word that is key. A lot of people condense that quote into one word, keyword. They then go off looking for the key word that will unlock the poem, and they never mention the full quote again. In my opinion, that is the exact wrong approach. It's throwing away data, and you never, never, never throw away data while you're working on a problem. Never. In terms of the chase, Throwing away data could be the difference between the right solution and the wrong solution. I have even seen people misquote Forrest's statements in a video that they just watched. The video is right there. You just watched it. How can you possibly misquote him? But they do. And how many times have you heard someone refer to the House of Brown instead of the Home of Brown? There's a difference. Seeing misquotes like these resulted in a rule that I made for myself. Outside of trusted sources, if I did not personally hear Forrest say it, then Forrest never said it. Hearing Forrest's tone and seeing his facial expressions was almost as important as his words. Was a remark said jokingly? Did Forrest wink afterwards? Did he smile? Was he being flippant with the interviewer? Did he blink a lot when making a remark? Did he glance to the left or the right? All of that was important information to me, and it's why I trusted video more than audio and trusted audio more than written articles. For the same reason, I preferred listening to the audio and watching the video over reading a transcript. Too much information is lost while transcribing. The Tears of Trust was one of the methods I implemented to reduce my susceptibility to cognitive bias. The Tears are, of course, completely subjective. They are based solely on my personal experience and gut feeling. Nothing more. Thank you for watching.